today, we're going to dig into some of what's going on in 4.9. Last week, if you watched it, uh, the OpenShift product management team went through a whole session on what's new in 4.9, and it's over two hours long. So, you know, this weekend, get in your PJs and, you know, grab some popcorn and watch that. Uh, so today, we're not going to, we don't have time to get into all of that. So we're going to cover a few key areas. And uh, Rob Zumsky uh, helped with this, and if you've watched the other OpenShift comments, uh, we already did a recording, but Rob is online. If you're watching this on the live stream or you're in Hopin right now, he's there answering questions. And um, I'm also on the OpenShift product management team. I'm Karina Angel. Um, I know a, a lot of you, but please come say hi during the break. All right, so let's dig into some of this. All right, first thing we want to talk about is how OpenShift is exploding for more than a single cluster use case. Um, almost all of our customers are running not only one or two, but 10, 20, uh, 100 clusters. And so you need standardized tools uh, to manage this fleet of OpenShift that's out there. All right, now it comes down to this multi-cluster layer. You need tools to manage your whole cluster. Your <laughs> you need tools for the multi-cluster management. You need a container registry to store all your artifacts and your applications, and your security, and getting your configuration and compliance checks across your fleet. And then there's this routing la layer. So your global ingress, your egress, your load balancing, your service mesh, and then bringing that into the cluster itself and getting encrypted tunnels between all of your clusters so they can talk together. And this goes all the way down to the node layer where you're actually interfacing with the, har with the hardware. So you're doing hardware offload, your super fast telco type workloads, um, your GPUs, your other machine learning tools, um, and it's all backed by multi-cluster storage your backups, your disaster recovery, and all your storage needs are met across the entire fleet. So that's the OpenShift ecosystem. Now, today, I want to talk about a couple areas in depth. So we have multi-cluster, security, automation, and when Christian runs over here from his keynote, he has a great demo set up for you. So covering these areas as well. Um, and so for each of these areas, we're gonna talk about what's going on in the upstream, what's going on right now, and then some futures. So let's talk about multi-cluster. Upstream, there's two main areas in the multi-cluster arena. First, there's open cluster management. Now, this is the upstream for our advanced cluster management product, and this is being bootstrapped right now and donated to the CNCF. So go visit it, um, join the community, and give it a star. So this is simplified fleet management, and it's key for managing all of your clusters. Um, there's a bunch of cool things under the hood for cluster provisioning, and it's through a project called OpenShift Hive. Now that's another open source project. Um, it provides a framework for doing governance and compliance tasks. Uh, so delivering your policies down to your fleet, um, auditing your fleets, making sure they're in compliance uh, with the policies and all other kinds of security and compliance needs. Another thing you need to do is actually deploy out to your fleet, your applications. So that's another key part of this project. Um, you can do dynamic placement and other policies around your applications. Um, so, replicated between, a sec, all right. Under the hood, it uses uh, projects like Argo CD, um, which we'll talk more about later, Open Policy Agent, which we'll also talk about more later, and Thanos for um, metrics and observability. Now, an 
another great thing that's happening upstream is all the work with the cluster API. This is a project out of a working group in the Kubernetes community that um, says it's designed to fill the gaps in tools like for um, like kubeadm. So kubeadm is a CLI for bootstrapping uh, kube clusters. Um, and it turned out to be not as declarative as you need for doing infrastructure as code workflows. So if you want to describe an entire cluster and maybe stamp it out 20, 30, 100 times, um, you weren't really able to do that with Kubadium. So this is, this is going to, this wraps around Kubadium and uh, provides a better tool for that. Let's see. So right now, in OpenShift for multi-cluster management, uh, all, a lot of that upstream work is being baked right into OpenShift. Uh, first, there's a cluster creation in ACM, so advanced cluster management. Uh, today, you can boot new clusters that'll automatically inherit all the role-based access control governance security policies that you have across your entire fleet. It sees a new cluster shows up, it automatically applies all of that policy. And you can also manage the full life cycle of all your OpenShift clusters. So that software upgrades, scaling out the cluster, managing other things like that. Another really cool feature is cluster pools. So just like we have a pools of um, machines, worker machines, you can have pools of clusters that you can claim. Um, so if you're doing some quality testing and you need a quick cluster, uh, you can go claim it, use it, tear it down, destroy it, um, all without having to wait for it to be installed. So that's a huge time saver, and it's really cool. Um, on the monitoring front, it's really important to have application deployed across your clusters. Um, have the big picture, um, so it's important to know what's going on, how many resources are you using, uh, have I claimed too many resources, um, am I using too many that are reserved and uh, not actually in use, so we have built-in dashboards for that. See, the networking arena, so this is really key. You have a front end that needs to talk to a database on a different cluster, or you've scaled out the database across two different clusters, and you need, they need to talk to each other. So extending that networking link is also key. Um, the advanced cluster management can help you expand that pod network across the encrypted link. Um, and another really cool thing is all your pod IPs continue to work, right? So it looks like Kubernetes does on a single cluster, but it's on multiple clusters, and it can be a ton of clusters. So that's really cool. And the CNCF uh, Submariner project is the backing technology here, so uh, go check that out too if you wanna dive further in. All right, quick roadmap for multi-cluster. Some key items. So the new cluster switcher, you can move in the UI, you can move between seeing all your clusters and then dive further into a single cluster if you need to debug or change configuration. Um, and some other things that are coming out in the ACM world, uh, just continuing to mature. And a shared SSO is something that can be very easily configured once you have access to all your fleet management tools. Uh, so we're looking into that, uh, as well as built-in default policies for governance and risk. So things like CIS compliance can be built into ACM. And the Submariner multi-cluster uh, networking that we talked about. And there are test workflows for that right now. So if you want to dive in and go look at that, uh, working on getting that to GA. But definitely, if you have feedback, uh, please let us know. All right, that's a really quick overview of the multi-cluster world. And of course, if you're online, ask Rob questions. He would love that. All right, now let's dive into security. All right. 
pod security. Pod security has been deprecated, and it was deprecated, and it's being replaced in um, Kubernetes 125, or at least that's the target removal. OpenShift still supports, just wanna make sure everybody's still clear, still supports security context constraints. So even though we're talking about upstream, just wanna, that's not going away. But if you are a partner or your clusters depend on pod security policy, uh, start looking into pod security. The future replacement for pod security policy is much, much simpler. So if you're used to more complex policies, you'll want to look into um, Open Policy Agent or OPA um, or Kyverno. So OPA right now is supported in uh, ACM uh, through a plugin. See, something else that's going on upstream where it intersects Kubernetes and Linux is the user namespaces. So user namespaces, that's something that works with SE Linux, and it protects the container context on the operating system, on the operating system node. Uh, so this is an intersection of that. Uh, it's actually a CRI, so it's a container runtime interface uh, feature that we already use in OpenShift, but the Kubernetes community is gonna plumb that all the way down uh, into Kubernetes, and when that happens, uh, OpenShift will start using it automatically. Um, what that allows you to do is user ID mapping. Uh, so if you have root inside your container, it doesn't mean that you have root outside or root on the host. Uh, so upstream, this enhancement proposal is still in progress, and so we hope to use that as soon as it lands. All right. So we talked about advanced cluster management, and now let's talk about advanced cluster security. Uh, I'm sure you've seen all the announcements on ACS. Uh, so advanced cluster management and advanced cluster security together with OpenShift, this is a um, offering called OpenShift Platform Plus, if you've already heard a lot about that. Um, so OpenShift here in the middle, uh, it comes with an immutable operating system. So with all the default security policies and the automated operations, uh, but now you have a number of different, different personas, and so we need additional tools to help out all of them. So starting on the left, right. depends on what screen I'm looking at. Uh, starting with advanced cluster uh, security, um, Say you have your security and your operations folks, uh, your SecOps, if you will. Those folks have a very focused role. Uh, they're looking at threats that are happening right now in the cluster. So real-time security incidents, as well as automated things like scanning for compliance and vulnerabilities, uh, auditing your network policies, uh, they can do all of that through advanced cluster security. Uh, and then affect the number of OpenShift clusters across the entire fleet with your standard set of policies. All right, now, where advanced cluster management comes into play is some of your other personas. You have developers that are deploying applications and they wanna store their applications as code, uh, and they can deploy all of that through advanced cluster management uh, so that you have exactly what's happening in production at any moment in time. Now, your DevOps team might be changing some cluster configuration at the same time, and they wanna have that also managed as code through security, for security. And so, going through the pipeline of changing around some of the default config on the cluster, uh, that can happen through that pipeline as well, uh, all orchestrated through advanced cluster management. And then, your security folks, they may want to affect some of those same cluster configs, uh, and they can do that through advanced cluster management, as well as deploy out uh, our Quay registry, um, so developers can scan those uh, things at build time. 
So one of the cool things is you can scan your containers, at build in ACM, and then uh, scan it again at runtime as you're going uh, through ACS. Okay, let's look at some of what's happening on our security roadmap. I mentioned compliance a few times. So we have a compliance operator that can do CIS uh, benchmarks and standards like that. We'd like to build that into the OpenShift console. Right now, uh, it's available in the ACS UI, so you can already look at that. Um, but we'd like to expand that even further. Uh, all right, and if you've been tracking uh, JetStack CERT Manager project, uh, it's a really popular tool for generating certificates for web applications. And we are productizing that and bringing that into OpenShift, and we're doing it in a unique way. Uh, it's going to be automated certificate management for all the users in your cluster, but it's going to do something kind of interesting. Where you can issue certs from a number of different places. Uh, so you can issue certs from the internal cluster CA, which is what uh, OpenShift uses right now. Or you can do it from your HashiCorp vault or Let's Encrypt. So Let's Encrypt is uh, more for web applications, so it's one of the traditional use cases for cert management. Now from those two, you can actually issue certs to a number of different places, and probably the main thing is gonna be uh, developer applications. And those are running on your cluster, but they can be used for operators uh, that are installed on your cluster. And if you have operators doing webhooks, um, if you need certificates from them, um, they can also, um, you can roll those through this project, as well as other Red Hat products like uh, middleware. All right. OpenShift sandbox containers. So this right now is available in Tech Preview for 4.9. So that, we're working towards uh, GAing that, and if you had feedback on your sandbox containers, again, reach out. And this lets you run your third party or your untrusted code. Uh, and it's designed for your applications that are cloud native. So they're already in your containers and they need a little bit of extra isolation and you wrap all of that in this extra kernel. Uh, so it's just a bit safer. Um, and we hope to get that FIPS certified by the second half of next year. Um, and FIPS, sure, we all know, but it's a US government standard security standard. All right, and last, user namespaces. We talked about this already, but uh, once this lands upstream, we wanna bring it out of the box into OpenShift, so for all the applications that are running in OpenShift. And this is especially helpful for OpenShift builds. And if you wanna use the Quay registry, uh, by design, they are third-party untrusted code and or just by nature, and we wanna protect those as much as possible. So further focus on security. All right, that is what we have for security. Uh, let's talk about automation. All right, we talked about platform level and management level automation earlier. Uh, what's also being driven across OpenShift is workload and development automation and standard standardization of how your applications are delivered automatically through your workflows. Now, there's a lot of innovation that is happening upstream. Uh, it's not on this slide, but what I really want to mention is the GitOps working group, uh, where Christian is right now. I haven't seen if he's, ah, there he is, thanks. So Christian was just there, but the GitOps working group is, uh, it's a very active community. And 
just kind of exemplifies what upstream is. Um, and just multiple companies coming together to focus on GitOps. And anyway, I want to mention, um, and that's through the application delivery technical advisory group. So if you want to get involved, go join that. So Argo CD is one of the most popular uh, projects in this area, and that's the upstream for OpenShift GitOps. Uh, and Argo, right now, I mean, there's continual support for Helm, customize other tools that are really popular, and um, consolidating those features into the user interface. Uh, previously, and still now, there's um, all the different interfaces that you have to switch between, and now they're being consolidated. Um, see, another thing, so for example, since Customize 4.2 has been pulled in, uh, now you can specify that Helm should include CRDs when inflating a chart, so that's cool. Um, Argo CD has also moved to project scope repositories and clusters, and what this means is that it makes it easier for developers to continue working without having to reach out to your cluster admin or needing your global configs. And another key enhancement, I didn't put it on here, is the application, uh, application sets. That's part of Argo CD. I know Christian is very excited about application sets. So, and with application sets, you can create, modify, and manage multiple applications through your templated automation. So previously, you could only do that through a single repo or namespace. All right, Tecton. Tecton is the upstream for OpenShift pipelines. Uh, it's continuing to gain maturity um, with pipeline as code. Teams can configure your builds, your tests, and deployment and code that's trackable and stored in the central repo. Um, and with this continued focus on DevSecOps, so security, running theme, so there's support for your rootless images, and your uh, experimental hermetic execution mode. So that removes the networking so that you can go ahead and test it without worrying about, uh, well, it just isolates it more and makes it more secure. All right. Um, one last note on Tecton, they're also doing a lot of work on um, advanced error handling and making it easier to debug your pipelines if something happens. So again, that maturity for the project. Kata. Kata is really interesting. So this is Kubernetes event-driven autoscaling. So that's what Kata stands for. Um, this is event-aware autoscaling. So currently with autoscaling, with your HPA, it's focused on CPU, memory. However, Kata has this concept of scalers. And what this means is that now you have different triggers, such as that you can set up, such as a SQL query, so that's cool, or a stream, or how many messages you have in your queue. So you have these different triggers that you can set up to scale um, your application. Um, also, exposing your cloud events. So cloud events, uh, this is, it's a specification out of the serverless working group. So that's another CNCF working group. And that allows you to um, set up, it's a specification defining a common standard or a common format for your event data. So that's really helpful in creating all the scalers. Um, so there's a lot of work being done there. Kata is being productized into OpenShift, and that's gonna not land for a little bit, but uh, we're doing a lot of work upstream on that as well. All right, hey native. I'm gonna make sure we have time for Christian's awesome demo. 
Knative is the upstream for OpenShift serverless. Um, and the Knative, the OpenShift serverless team uh, really drives a lot of work upstream. Um, so there's so much going on. Uh, so Knative functions. The OpenShift serverless team donated the, all the work being done on functions um, to Knative um, and to the Knative sandbox. Um, they're also driving a creation of a functions working group. So if you're interested in serverless functions, uh, go get involved upstream. Um, and also they're putting a lot of effort into, uh, there's a function repository directory that has all kinds of runtimes and templates. Um, or, and then, let's see, Apache Kafka. The eventing team has done a lot of integration work with Apache Kafka upstream. So there's so much going on uh, integrating those as well. And for serving, uh, talked earlier about the end-to-end -end encryption. So driving a lot of um, work upstream on encrypting all hops through your cluster. Um, and there's a lot of cold start improvements too, so. All right, so what's happening right now? Again, I wanna talk about, so workload automation as well as cluster automation. Workload automation, all that work being done upstream for your GitOps and your pipelines, that's all coming downstream. Uh, also integration work with advanced cluster management and uh, a lot of off cluster automation. So more integration with Ansible. Also talked about the scaling, uh, dynamic scaling uh, using CADA as the backing technology. And uh, under the covers it uses the uh, horizontal pod autoscaler. So puts a wrap around that. And by default, the pod autoscaler uses CPU and memory utilization to autoscale. And CADA um, just expands on that. Cluster automation. All right, we talked about multi-cluster management just want to highlight all the different areas where automation is being driven across the platform. So automation through advanced cluster management, so manage your entire fleet uh, through ACM and right now definitely want to highlight you can manage up to a thousand clusters in a single hub and that's just amazing. That's a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of clusters. So started this by saying that, you know, we see that a lot of customers are, are using, you know, 10, 20, 100, it's even up to 1,000. So, and even more, they're testing further from that. And want to also highlight that by design, OpenShift 4 is designed to automate all your operations. And operators themselves are designed to automate your workloads, your day two operations, sorry. All right, automation roadmap, and then we can get to Christian's amazing demo. No pressure though. <laughs> All right, the, um, some highlights on the automation roadmap. All right. Again, continuing to build on all the work being done upstream for Tecton and GitOps, or Argo C and Tecton. All right, and integrating further with uh, Tecton Hub so it's easier to pull uh, the workloads in, or the workflows in from Tecton Hub, and a lot more uh, pipelines as code use cases. Uh, something really exciting will be the GA of OpenShift Builds V2 uh, and build packs for pipelines. 
So move in from OpenShift builds to V2. And of course, the sandbox containers and pipelines. So there's so much happening and so much that's going to land. Um, exciting times. Um, serverless, again, that CADA integration, talked about CADA before, and that will be probably more in the looking at 4.11 and beyond timeframe to bring that into OpenShift serverless, but it's on the horizon and that'll be Knative and CADA complement each other, so that'll be great bringing that into OpenShift serverless. Um, advanced cluster management, so I mentioned a thousand clusters, they're gonna be doing even more testing and improving the performance and scale of managing across the entire fleet. Um, there's so much more I could say, but I wanna make sure we have time for your demo. All right, so we talked about multi-cluster, the multi-cluster layer, and each of the layers. And uh, Christian, if you wanna come show us what you have prepared. Let's go, is it, oh, it's on? There we go. All right. Do you want me to switch out? Yeah. All right, cool. Oh. Is it yours? I don't know, okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Good? Thumbs up? All right. Um, cool. Yeah, oh, look at that. You guys have a monitor here. So this is really cool, by the way. This is like the first time I've seen this in any, um, any conference. So let me quickly set up here because I actually want to mirror my desktop and not just... Hopefully this doesn't cause a kernel panic. Okay. All right, does it look good? Should I make it a little bigger? Maybe just the scotch. Okay, there we go. So, um, actually, um, by the way, it's great to see everyone here. Um, it's, it's, it's a little awkward, right, to, to be back at conferences after, you know, so, so so long uh, not being at conferences and seeing everyone in 3D is 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 is, is actually really cool. It's a little weird. Where I guess we'll get over the awkwardness as the week goes, and um, it'll uh, it, you know it'll be really cool. Actually, um, a, a quick shout out to uh, Grish. Uh, Grish is someone I've worked at Red Hat for a long time. This is a, a demo sort of halfway inspired uh, by some of the talks he's had with his customers, um, where we talk about how OpenShift, ACS, ACM. It's all better together, right? And so um, I'm kind of kind of go through a work uh, workflow to talk a, a little bit about how you can integrate uh, ACS and all its own functionalities into OpenShift and into ACM um, and into pipelines to kind of just see how you can have that security integrated all in. So um, here I have um, ACM, right? So uh, Advanced Cluster Manager. I'm supposed to say Red Hat Advanced Cluster Manager. Sorry. Um, and so uh, here I have a list of my clusters. Um, again, it has like, um, if you worked with ACM before, you should see that uh, there's my, my local cluster. I keep forgetting I have the monitor, but I'm so used to looking this way. Um, as you can see, I have the local, um, this is the whole lo local hub cluster. There's a little test cluster here. This is actually um, which, what I really think is really cool about ACM um, is that uh, this actually test cluster is be in my home lab behind a firewall and ACM is still managing it. So for those who have like things like disconnected clusters or um, air, air gap clusters, ACM can still work in a model um, where you can still have that secured, right? So this is literally, this, it's a server sitting under, under my desk. Um, but um, I'm also managing uh, this cluster called cluster two. And I can, um, uh, from here, it gives me certain information about the, the cluster. Um, you know, what version that there's an upgrade available, that um, 
uh, that there's nine nodes in this cluster is actually pretty big because you'll see why in a second. Um, looks like there's a, an issue being identified here uh, that wasn't there yesterday, so I won't click on that. Um, and then you can actually go to the, the cluster here itself. Um, and uh, this is OpenShift, uh, one of the managed clusters here. There we go. Um, and part of this installation is that I'm actually running um, ACS, right? So just like anything with OpenShift, just like the, the, the entry point for anything in OpenShift, right, is the operator hub. You go to the operator hub, it's there, right? Um, and so this is uh, Advanced Cluster Manager. I've already pre-installed it, um, pre-set it up here. And I kind of want to go through just a little bit about um, ACS in general, right? So, um, so see here, this is a dashboard at first glance. You can see that I have um, some system violations, right? I have zero critical. I have 165 high. You know, I have all of these at a glance. I can see what, what's, what's going on here. Um, I can see my top riskiest deployment. And you have to kind of keep in mind with security, especially with ACS, this is all relative, right? So risky, it just means relative to what it finds, right? So I have, since I have zero critical, risky doesn't necessarily mean critical, it just means these are the, the top offenders of what you have here. Um, um, and it shows you the list of those deployments. Um, I'd like to take a look. This is, this is my favorite page, by the way, of ACS. Um, when, when I first started working with ACS, I'm like, I wish I had this you know, back in OpenShift 3 and OpenShift 2 sort of thing. I, I, I Like, seriously, right? So here you can see the top um, violation is that someone accessed a secret. The secret just happens to have the cube admin password. So that, it, it raised that as a, um, uh, as, as, a, as a violation, right? And right now it's set up just for, um, just to note it, right? You can set it to either block it or you can set it to it to fire off alert to pager duty, right? Hey, someone accessed the secret. Um, you know, it accessed it multiple times. This is not a big deal because it was me accessing the secret. Um, but this is actually um, um, uh, really cool. This is probably like one of my favorite things is, is like, I, I wish I had a way to just it notify me when someone's accessing something in my cluster. Um, some of the vulnerability management here. Yeah, there we go. So um, this gives you an information of the top riskiest uh, deployments, right? So here there is um, an application called Pricelist that um, Jason, I don't know if he's around, he, he helped me build it a long, long time ago and he made fun of me because I misspelled purse list when I first built it. But anyway, um, this tells me the image that I got scanned there is um, the top riskiest components here. It tells you that it, uh, which CVE and if, whether it's fixable or not. So basically you can have information that tells you, hey, um, you know, hey, you need to, you know, rebuild this image. You need to make sure this image is updated. You can go back to your developers and say, hey, you know, we found these vulnerabilities. I'm not gonna, um, we're not gonna deploy this out. Um, you know, we, it, it could be as simple as, here, there are a bunch of RPMs, so it's just as simple as a DNF update on the image. So, um, but it's, this is like my top riskiest one because I think I built this like a year, two years ago, I'm not sure. Um, one last thing is the uh, network diagram, which I also really, really like as well. You can uh, see the network flows, for example, here, I wanna choose, okay, do it. So this shows um, the network flows it shows um, what is connecting to what. Here, there's an ingress um, network flow. You can do things like uh, list network policies, and you can actually do things like uh, simulate a network policy. So you, don't, um, you can see what's gonna block what without it actually doing it. Um, and you can actually um, uh, do that workflow here. So you can actually see at a glance how everything is connected to everything else and what is allowing access to what. As you, is, uh, let me bring back that, that, that page. Um, um, this one right here is like, it, it says um, these, these workflows here, it's kind of anomalous. Why? Because it's wide open to everyone, right? So the stack rocks right away, sorry, ACS. Stack, uh, ACS um, right away tells you that, hey, this traffic is wide open to everyone and you may wanna take a look at it. And then you can simulate again in the network policy simulator. So this is all great. This is all great tool for, um, for an admin 
right? A uh, great, great tool for uh, you know, security practitioners who are having uh, containerized workloads coming in. Um, but really what I wanna show is that um, how you can integrate it in your pipelines, right? So, um, you know, the, um, Karina was talking about Argo and Tekton, that's kind of like the world I'm in right now. Um, here I have an application, right, that's deployed with Argo CD. Um, oh, by the way, if I go back to ACS, actually ACS um, sees that it's an Argo application, right? So you, it actually, there's that integration there, so just really quick. But back to the, the demo app. So there's a, there's a demo application here that is built using pipelines and deployed using Argo CD. Um, if I go to the, uh, here we go, the um, pipelines here. So I have a pipeline here, this, um, uh, this pipeline uh, built that application and deployed that application. But part of the building process I have integrated with ACS to where it'll run the security checks um, while it's building and it'll either block or it'll allow the, the, um, the, uh, the build to continue fully to deployment run. As you see here, um, I built it initially, it went through. Um, I've added a few more security checks to the ACS integration, right? So we, because we want to um, see it fail, right? Um, so let's, let's start this build process. So this build process kind of kicks off, takes a little bit because if you've worked with pipelines that actually goes and grabs a persistent volume first as a workspace, so you can use it as a workspace to do the git cloning right here. So there is a, uh, there's a git clone that happens, there's a deployment check, meaning there's that security uh, scan that happens using ACS, and then the deployment happens afterwards. So let me put the, uh, the logs here. So this takes a little bit, there it goes. Um, so it does the git clone, and as you can see here, let me see if I can expand this, make it a little bigger. Um, we do all this with UIs, and in the end, we just like the terminals, right? Um, so here, uh, as you can see, it went, it went by really quick. Looks like I have a bunch of violations. Um, uh, the initial uh, violation, I guess for my namespace, uh, there was no violations, because that, that's all that was sent in the initial run. Um, and it looks like I have uh, some CVEs that I need to fix. So there's, um, um, there's like the version of curl, the version of, of BusyBox, right? Um, and various other violations. So it sets the overall status to fail. So once it fails, here I go back to the details page, and I go back to the pipelines runs. It didn't actually finish, and it didn't actually deploy, it, it, it stopped, right? It stopped short of deploying the application. Um, as you see here, it's still on that same version. Um, and this is how you can use ACS within your pipelines to kind of stop this at the, um, um, I guess stop it at the source, right? Just like literally, <laughs> we're talking about the Git clone, does a scan, it could do an image scan, it can do um, uh, policy scans from your YAML file, right? So like if you're doing a GitOps workflow and you're storing your YAML in Git, it can actually s scan those and make sure it's to compliance, right? And compliance meaning whatever you set, the rule sets that you set for your environment. So, um, so that's the, I think I'm almost at time. Yeah, uh, good timing. Um, so that's it from, from, from a high level that you can show how you can not only use ACM to deploy multiple clusters, but you can also use ACS uh, to manage the policies on those clusters. And then also um, uh, integrate your pipelines from a developer standpoint, from a developer workflow. You can, um, uh, developers can then be notified early and often when uh, a violation exists or whether they need to update. Um, not have it further down, right? You don't want that further down in your process where um, you know, you're delaying um, uh, a deployment of your application because uh, there's a security violation and they have to rebuild and redo the whole process. You scan that early and often and be alerted early and often and have it fully integrated into one platform. So um, yeah, with that, thank you very much. And um, I'm not sure who's up next. Stu, is coming here? Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. Uh, 